Good evening. Hi. Just keep eating. Thank you. Stop talking, but keep eating. Hi, I'm Michael Shabon. I'm the chairman of the board of the McDowell Colony, and it is my great honor and pleasure and delight to be here standing in front of you this evening in this magnificent new space for our annual McDowell National Benefit. What an incredible recreation of a defining moment, uh, and may I say a somewhat overdue recreation of a defining moment in our history. Um, more evidence, if evidence were needed, that you know, it's, not, it's not our tragedies and even our shining moments and our shameful moments that shape our idea of what kind of country we live in. It's the way our artists interpret those moments for us and present them to you. That defines them in our minds. Uh, this, what you heard tonight is the work, as you saw on the screen, of uh, McDowell Fellow and my fellow board member, Tanya Leon. McDowell Fellow, yes, she's incredible. And we love her and we appreciate her service on our board so dearly. Uh, McDowell Fellow, Tulani Davis. And Henry Louis Gates, Jr. And uh, Tanya and Tulani are here with us tonight somewhere, and would they, I hope they wouldn't mind just standing up and maybe taking a bow. If, I think you're I'm not sure where they are. Oh, there's, there's Tanya. Fantastic. So welcome. This is an evening to have some fun, to raise some money, hopefully lots of money, and to remind us that art is omnipresent, it's everywhere, and if we attend to art, we will be attending to the world. Art helps us open our eyes to see the world in a fresh way. Artist's curiosity becomes our curiosity, and we pay attention, and we notice, and sometimes we object. Before we get rolling, I wanted to thank our benefit co-chairs, Christine Fisher and Anne Stark Locker. I'm not sure where they are, somewhere out there. These women worked so incredibly hard to put this together, to bring us to this new space. Uh, their vision and their commitment to the work that we do as the McDowell Board and the work that McDowell does in the world is unparalleled and this evening would have been impossible without them. So thank you, Christine and Anne. I also want to thank our event committee members, Barbara Case Senchak, Carol Ostrow, <laughs> Rena Stone, and McDowell fellow, Julie Heffernan. And it's one, yay, woo. I think one of the coolest things about McDowell's board and the work that we do to sustain and support McDowell is that so many of our board members are McDowell fellows and that when we, when we need help on the board, when we need assistance, we can turn to our fellows, even if they aren't board members, and ask for them to help us with all their many talents. And to Julie, uh, her, one of her, a piece of her stunning work was featured out there. You saw it on the invitations. There's a piece of work out there um, that is for auction tonight. I hope you admired it. I even hope that you coveted it. Um, I'm sure that it will go fast, so please um, bid on it so that you can gloat um, when you see the person who was your underbidder. <laughs> There's something, an app for that, I believe. Gloating, I mean. Uh, the, uh, now, every year we have honorary chairs. All of these kinds of shindigs tend to have honorary chairs. Um, and we were unusually blessed this year with a really um, high-powered, impressive coterie, uh, which includes director Todd Haynes, visual artist Kara Walker, filmmaker, curator, and philanthropist Tatiana von Furstenberg, and McDowell Fellows, Stephen Karam, Glenn Ligon and Catherine Stockett. So thanks to all of them.
Um, our corporate donors also understand the importance of art, and especially now at this time, the special importance of the kind of interpretation, the kind of eye-opening that artists do for us. Um, and those corporate sponsors, we, without them, again, we would not be able to be here this evening. And their belief in art and in artists is remarkable. And when we think of corporate culture, it's a, it, it, it tends to be of aspects of corporations and corporate life that um, are very different from what we are all here to celebrate tonight. But in fact, it's an, it's an essential part of what these corporations do, what these companies do. And that's Pelly Clark Pelly, Penguin Random House. First Republic Bank. And our corporate friends, the Michael Rosenfeld Gallery, my very own Harper Collins, and Ravenswood Generating Station. Thank you to all of you. We're deeply grateful. Now in these times, um, there's been a meme floating around that you might have encountered whenever the, the uh, conversation turns to federal support for the arts, in particularly in the um, form of the NEA. Um, and this is a quote that is attributed to Winston Churchill, who is one of the eight people to whom all quotes must be attributed, oh, you know, along with Oscar Wilde, Mark Twain, Fran Lebowitz, and there's about four others. Uh, and uh, supposedly, when he, it was suggested to Churchill that um, the British government, Her Majesty's, or His Majesty's government at the time, cut funding for the arts um, it, in order to give it to the war effort, um, Churchill supposedly responded, if we do that, then what the hell are we fighting for? Yes, it's a really beautiful, admirable sentiment. I'm sorry to tell you that he did not actually say that, those words. <laughs> Um, I did. I, I said it, and he, he said, like, that's good, could I use that? And, you know, I didn't know I was going to be up here doing this, or I would have said no, but, yeah, he stole all my best lines. Um, that kind of leadership, the idea of that leadership, the recognition of this central importance to society of its arts and artists, that they, that, that is, in some sense, the only thing worth fighting for. Freedom of expression and everything that it entails. It's a benefit to all of us. It's very much on our minds now and, and you know I wanted to bring it up on this stage and talk about McDowell's place as a leader in the field um, and especially in that we provide these residencies to artists and we've been doing it now for 110 years. Which those of you who have been around for, thank you. That means it's been 10 years since, I know it's like, duh, it's simple math, but it's been 10 years since our 100th anniversary, which um, surprises me. It just feels like it went by in the blink of an eye. Um, 110 years of human accomplishment, human disaster, tumult, peace, war, tragedy, art. One thing that's remained constant throughout that 110 years, that century and a dime, is McDowell's commitment to artists and the work that they do. It started as a crazy, outlandish idea cooked up by the remarkable Marion McDowell. Um, what, uh, what one um, of her early donors or sponsors, I believe it was J.P. Morgan, might have been Winston Churchill, um, <laughs> dismissed as a home for indigent bohemians. <laughs> the idea to provide a space, calm, solitude as needed in a turbulent world that doesn't really care very much about artists and what they do, to create a space where that is the only thing we care about, is artists and what they do. Um, that idea of hers, of Mrs. McDowell's, became the model on which all residency programs across North America and in many other countries have been uh, founded. And we're proud to be the progenitor of this model, what was termed at the time that she first dreamed it up, the McDowell idea. 
or was it a Peterborough idea, actually, I believe. It was through Edward and Mary McDowell's original vision and Marion's fierce belief in the power of uninterrupted time and space to enable the creative process that the colony made it through the early lead years, where she was literally touring the country. I mean, I know many of you have probably heard this story, passing a hat. She, she was soliciting people's tiny contributions personally all over the country. And eventually she turned to um, sponsors with deeper pockets, names like Carnegie, Vanderbilt, Morgan, um, other people named after hotels <laughs> and small colleges. And um, she persuaded them as well to the extent that they needed persuading that art doesn't just matter, that it defines a society, it defines a culture. And we are here to celebrate her dream, her vision, her idea, her dogged persistence. She's the one who got this colony going under her stewardship and guidance. It grew and grew and grew, and it thrives to this day because of her vision and her ability to translate that vision to people who might be able to help support it. That brings me to all of you. I'm, I'm here to ask you to take on the mantle to fill the shoes of Andrew Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, Cornelius Vanderbilt, on maybe not quite on the same scale, although, I mean, if, you're, if you have enough to drink, um, I won't discourage you. And to show, to speak and prove that you believe that the most important way that we define ourselves as a society is through our art and our artists and the work that they do. So I'm here to exhort you and to thank you for your commitment to the McDowell idea and thank you for giving so generously to the colony. Um, I'm gonna introduce now uh, my longtime fellow board member but my brand new president He's um, serving alongside me now. I don't know if I'm Mr. Spock and he's Captain Kirk, or he's Captain Kirk and I'm Mr. Spock, but um, I'm so, I love him so much and I'm so happy to have him as a new president. Um, it was very hard for anyone to fill the shoes left by Susan Davenport Austin when she stepped down, but Andy's um, off to a really exciting start and he's gonna tell you some things now while I go sit down and join you in eating because he won't mind if you eat while he talks, so. Thank you. I'll see you later. Enjoy the show. So, so thank you, Michael. And I just learned something about Michael Shaban. He actually writes as he speaks. It's amazing. He wrote that whole thing while he was standing here. So for the past seven years, uh, So for the past seven years, uh, Susan Austin, uh, McDowell's president, has spoken right after Michael. And um, over the course of those seven years, uh, my admiration for Susan, where is she? I need to focus on her. Where are you, Susan? Right. Oh, good. OK. Stay right there. My admiration for Susan her job as president has grown and grown. We've been very fortunate to have her intelligence, judgment, dedication, and good nature in our service. And just as Susan had found it daunting to follow Michael in speaking, I find it to follow her as president. However, I will, as Michael put it, commit to walk in her metaphorically large shoes. But before I ask you to give her a round of applause, I need to make a confession regarding my behavior towards her, which has tested the limits of her good nature. On at least two occasions, I've been unable to resist the temptation to call Susan Susie. <laughs> On both occasions, she told me that no one living has ever done that. <laughs> Now that this confession is behind me, please give Susie Susan Austin a round of highly deserved applause.
Yes, and just don't call her Susie. Okay, over the course of the last year, since, since our last gala, McDowell Fellows have been busy. Uh, one received a Tony, another a National Book Award, three received Pulitzers, there were three MacArthurs, and an astonishing 21 Guggenheims. This is all in one year, the 110th year. I know, Vijay, you didn't get another one this year. <laughs> I know, it's not right, it's just not right. Anyway, the question arises, what makes an organization like ours, more than 110 years old, and a recipient of the National Medal of Arts in its centennial year, in its centennial year so enduring? Well, I have a naive belief that is the power of a simple idea, that giving the gift of the freedom to create, playing out in a world of enormous and growing complexity, delivers the works of art that sustain our culture and help us to comprehend the world. And that's what McDowell does. McDowell, thank you. <laughs> McDowell Fellows not only receive a cabin in the woods, but when necessary, financial aid for personal emergencies, childcare, tuition assistance, and travel so that they may have the necessary freedom for their art. We also support groundbreaking voices in nonfiction. To legendary writers such as James Baldwin and Francis Fitzgerald, and to contemporary authors Sherry Frank, William Finnegan, Tahna Hasi Coates, Adrian Nicole LeBlanc, Shane Bauer, and Neil McFarha, who received the 2017 Pulitzer. These writers are just a few among the many who keep journalism vibrant and relevant in an environment more and more saturated with the messages sent to the shortest of attention spans. Our art journalism, our art journalism initiative, launched in 2015, has a goal to invest four and a half million dollars in fellowships and projects linking emerging networks of publishers, nonprofit news organizations, and other media outlets comprising the journalism community to McDowell's artistic community. That link just has to be made so that the voices that receive the, the support of McDowell, the artists, those of you in this room, their voices are heard throughout the country in the media and not drowned out by the other forms of media that we have become accustomed to, have been, have been subjected to. <clears throat> so we have received a $1 million lead matching gift from the Calderwood Charitable Foundation and $15,000 worth of gifts for fellowships for people like you. And in this initiative, we are making a difference and we will, we will make these fellowships available to journalists who write long form, serious journalism. In addition to that, we've been working hard to ensure that artists at all stages of their careers are generously supported. We have a new NEA grant of $25,000, which will be matched by private funding. And we're able to, now we're able to host more first time artists at the colony. And as an aside, McDowell was one of the first recipients of the NEA grants when it was established. And um, we have relied on it heavily. If the NEA goes away, we won't, but I hope it doesn't. Um, I, want you, I want to thank you so much for coming out to support McDowell tonight. And don't forget to bid in our silent auction and give generously to this organization. A Colony Fellow and a board member, Lewis Hyde, in his now classic book, The Gift, and Lewis is here tonight, quotes Whitman, the gift is to the giver and comes back most to him. It cannot fail. Now I'd like to uh, have um, honorary chair and director Todd Haynes and Colony Fellow Brian, Brian Selznick 
come to the podium. Where are you? Oh, good. Can't see a thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm actually supposed to speak after Todd. Todd wanted to be here. He wasn't able to be here, so he's prepared a special video uh, introduction and hello for everybody. But I just needed to say before you see this, there was a little crossed wire, and Todd thought this entire evening was in honor of me. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so I got to see a little sneak preview of what <laughs> I'm actually not kidding at all, as you'll see in a moment. Um, so just, just, let's just go with it and know that when he says, know that when he says Brian Selznick, what he means is McDowell. All right. Hi. Hello, everyone. I so wish I could be there tonight in New York to celebrate with everybody but I wanted to be sure and at least express a few thoughts about my dear friend and colleague, Brian Selznick, who's being honored tonight at the McDowell Colony Benefit. Um, Brian, who is an amazingly sexy man, is also an incredibly talented writer. And so I hear. Um, no, I, I have to say that I'm, you know, still, it's still new to me to make films based on other people's scripts. And I was so incredibly fortunate that Brian offered uh, his adaptation, his first screen adaptation from one of his novels of Wonderstruck to me um, and thought of me uh, with the urging of uh, a close dear friend of both of ours, Sandy Powell, the costume designer. Um, because the experience has been so incredibly rich in so many ways. And Brian's, not only, you know, starting with what he did as a graphic novelist with this book, that I think took such formal risks and experimentation in paralleling a story told in images with a story told in prose, asking the reader to fill in the gaps and to ignite the imagination, uh, to, to create the connections between these two stories and to give it that sense of life, uh, but to really trust the reader in that process. And I think that's something that I, in my own way as a filmmaker, has, have tried to do as well, formally. But the amazing gift of this script was that Brian really adapted it to a cinematic language and so understands and so uh, was so motivated by cinema in the way that that script was imagined on the page and became fully visual and rhythmic and full of momentum and life, really as a film that you can imagine seeing as you read it. And so it was an amazing privilege to be able to take that. And I'm sure it wasn't always easy for him to have somebody take that vision and transform it into something uh, of their own. And he gave me that trust and he gave me that script. And I want to thank Brian for that amazing privilege and for this incredible experience that we've had working on Wonderstruck together. And I want to thank the McDowell Colony for providing Brian with the space and the nurturing and the environment that helped bring this work to life to begin with. So here's to Brian Selznick and to the McDowell Colony for all the amazing work that you guys do. Cheers. <laughs> well, I got something to send my mom. <laughs> so Todd Haynes has been one of my favorite filmmakers since Poison came out in 1991. I was so honored when Todd agreed to make the movie. I uh, worked on Wonderstruck for two months uh, in Kirby. Uh, any other Kirby fellows here? Um, and it was a, an amazing, wonderful, beautiful, nurturing time. And I probably did. I write and so I write and illustrate children's books, and I tell stories with words and pictures. 
And the time that I was there, I probably did about 400 uh, sketches and drawings for this book, as well as working on the text. And Kirby was very instrumental. If you see a copy of uh, Wonderstruck, which is about uh, 600 pages long, with about 300 pages of pictures, uh, the, the chair that I sat in at Kirby is in the book, the window uh, that I look through uh, at Kirby is in the book. Um, there's a character named Walter, who is a young man named Liam, who I met in the kitchen. There's a character named Rose, uh, who uh, was a, a, a poet named Jean Valentine, who was there, and Jean uh, posed as this character. And now I got to write the script, as you learned from this very extensive uh, talk from Todd about me. And uh, uh, Rose is going to be played by Julianne Moore in the movie. We filmed it last summer. Uh, we have a 12-year-old deaf girl named Millie, who's never acted before, who's the star of the movie, and uh, these two other amazing boys. And the story takes place half in 1977 and half in 1927. And the half in 1927 is black and white and silent. And at first you think it's silent because it's 27 and it's like an old silent movie but it's actually because we learn that the main character is deaf. And so we're seeing it from her, experiencing it from her point of view. The 77 story, the boy is a hearing child, but he becomes deaf during the course of this, the uh, events of the story. And the, the two, these two narratives weave back and forth, both in the book and in the screenplay and in the movie. And the movie uh, is going to be premiering at the Cannes Film Festival next month. And then it will be released uh, on October 20th. And Todd uh, has arranged for us to see a sneak preview from the movie. And, and no one else has seen any of this. I just got to see the finished movie. I should also say briefly, I am wearing a suit <laughs> that... <laughs> Besides getting the applause of an entire benefit, uh, is a stylized forest. I wanted you to know that I came dressed as McDowell. Um, and I just wanted to say that, that what you're going to see, we have a short clip from the movie, um, and you're going to get to see a section from both parts. A large part of the narrative takes place at the Museum of Natural History, who allowed us to film in the actual museum. And so uh, Ed Lockman, the cinematographer, managed to make footage that looks like it was shot in 1977 and footage that was filmed in 1927. Thank you, McDowell, for making this book possible. Thank you so much on behalf of all the artists here who you have supported and all the artists over the years that you have uh, brought life to and support and, and the nurturing that you do. So thank you and enjoy the clip. Thank you. My name is Cheryl Young. I'm the executive director of McDowell. Thank you all for turning out for Brian Selznick tonight. I really appreciate that. One of the things that I have always marveled at my 30 years, yes, not quite 30 years at McDowell, is the effortless, no, effortless sense of community that rises up around the colony. I think that is because McDowell has always been about people. It's about artists of different disciplines who have something to say to each other and about people's lives who are made better by art. There have been innumerable personal contacts at McDowell, friendships made, lifelong collaborations, and all of that happens because there's a place in the woods that the McDowells had envisioned as a place for people. And then there are, are, are all of you who love art and in showing your sense of community by being at events like this tonight. McDowell is a community, a community that spans generations and spans across borders. And in the earliest days of the colony, Mrs. McDowell, because Edward McDowell had died um, quite young, Mrs. McDowell carried forward the dream. She went across the country, as Michael was saying, and she knew that that connection that people make over art was incredibly important. So these clubs sp sprung up all over the country uh, before there was a colony up in Peterborough and raised money for the colony. And the first one was here in New York. And within moments of 
announcing that there would be an Edward McDowell Association, there were 600 members. And we have 300 tonight. Um, and we have thousands of artists ar around New York, and we have 8,000 artists that we've supported in 110 years. So in that spirit, I'm sure Mary McDowell would be thrilled to hear that in our second century, McDowell will have a beautiful new home in New York City. I'm very happy that this long time aspiration will be realized thanks to the leadership of the board and the invaluable support of McDowell patrons, Tom Putnam, Eleanor Briggs, Fred Clark, Pelly Clark Pelly, the Senchecks, visionary Barry Diller in IAC, and many others who are in this room with us tonight. We will be opening our new space in the heart of Chelsea, Steps from the High Line on West 23rd Street. And I want to thank you all for your belief and commitment to the idea that art is best shared, and that by having a gathering place, we can now share it with all of you. As a national organization, there is another practical reason for our expansion into this new, larger space. We must stay fresh. That's the theme of the evening. Each year, McCartell receives and evaluates thousands of artist applications for the 300 fellowships that we award each year. These applications come from all over the world, 57 countries this past year, and from every state in the nation. Our visibility here in New York will help us to continue to attract the most talented artists and lead the field. It gives me great pleasure to announce that in addition to this physical visibility that will be freshening up our online digital identity as well. And I have a little clip just to pique your interest. We won't be um, revealing it um, for another few months. But Liko, if you could run that. This is the space. <laughs> So you'll be seeing a little bit of that when our banner goes up on uh, West 23rd Street later this year. And when we reach out to you, please come and see us. In closing, I'd like to introduce two more fellows to round out the evening. And I, before I do, I just want to make sure, because I think people, when you reach for your wine glasses, you're really meaning to reach for the iPad. On your table, there are some incredible experiences being offered, including in this new space. Um, and we'll be talking about that later. But the, the, the um, silent or auction por portion will be closing at 9.30. So you've got a little bit of time. But don't forget to reach over your wine glass. Um, this evening, I'm so pleased to introduce fellows Paula Vogel and Rebecca Tashman who collaborated in McDowell in 2011 on their newest play, Indecent, which is playing on Broadway right now. Good evening. I'm Paula Vogel. I'm Rebecca Tashman. Uh, just a, a few words. When I first went to McDowell, I was 27 years old, facing an eviction notice in my illegal sublet. You've heard this story before. <laughs> And I had just given up my German Shepherd uh, in my studio apartment because I couldn't afford the dog food, when lo and behold, I got an invitation to come to McDowell. Um, and uh, I have enjoyed four or five visits to McDowell, um, and I have to tell you, each time I see the Hallmark movie with Marion McDowell, and each time I cry and then go back to my cabin and work all night. So um, this is a thank you. Rebecca and I are going to introduce a little excerpt from the beginning of our play. Um, when I was 22 years old, 
I went to the library at Cornell University. A professor had told me, there's a play you need to read. And I read The God of Vengeance by Sholem Ash. Uh, which was out of print. Sholem Ash was a 24-year-old newlywed man when he wrote this play, and I read it standing up. Uh, here's the brief plot synopsis. It concerns a Jewish brothel owner who is using the money from his brothel to introduce his daughter into respectable society and to bribe a marriage. And the only hitch is he's running the brothel in the basement of his home, and his daughter falls in love with a prostitute downstairs. <laughs> now, I have to tell you, to this point in time, I'm now 65 years old, enjoying my final Broadway debut. I have not yet read a play anywhere that has as beautiful a love scene as the love scene this young newlywed man wrote between two women. And that has stayed with me. Enter Rebecca, who read the play when she was 26 in the stacks at Yale. And she decided to stage the obscenity trial because this play was a controversial success in Yiddish all through Europe. And it played on the Lower East Side for decades. Someone got the bright idea, let's translate it into English and put it on Broadway. On opening night, the cast was arrested for obscenity. It has remained a footnote of the first time that two women kissed on the Broadway American stage. So we have been working for the past seven years, uh, along with Lisa Gutkin and Aaron Halva, who we've taken extant uh, Yiddish and Jewish songs with this beautiful through line uh, that's composed by them, with the choreographer David Dorfman, with this extraordinary company of 10, um, and uh, we have wanted to present, uh, first of all, bring Sholem Ash back to Broadway after he was shut down in 1923, but also a little Kaddish from our hearts of how very possible it is for us to lose culture uh, in dangerous times. Uh, and Rebecca, do you want to set this up? Sure. So let me just say also, Paula and I were in Velton. I don't know how many of you had your residency in Velton, but it was where Thornton Wilder wrote apparently Our Town. And it was one of the greatest gifts. I think it's where Indecent began, and I'm not sure it would exist were it not for McDowell. So it's a great honor and delight to be here. Um, a few things that will just help you through our brief performance. Um, which will be by our glorious band and two of our seven acting troupe members. You can come see us at the court if you want to see the whole thing. Um, we'll share with you a truncated version of the beginning of Indecent without staging and without titles which are projected on the back wall of the stage. The character Lemel, are you guys following me? <laughs> the character Lemel who you will meet at the top of this little performance is played by one actor, Ben Cherry, but he will also play the role of Sholem Ash tonight. Imagine, if you will, a dance at the top with dust pouring from the sleeves of overcoats as our troop of 10 is introduced. When you hear remember this, imagine two women dancing as if in the rain. Finally, after a taste of song, imagine, as a scene begins, large writing on the back wall that reads, Maja and Sholem Ash in bed, reading the first draft of The God of Vengeance, Warsaw, 1905. Thank you. Gentlemen, our actors who play many, many roles tonight. First, the founding members of our troupe, Vera Parniski and Otto Godowski. They play all of the fathers, all of the mothers, the sagest of our characters, or 
the ones who remain fools at any age. And the members of our troupe who are in their prime, Alina Sajinsky and Mendel Schultz, they play all of the vamps, all of the vice, the scarred, and the schemers. And our ingenues, Hannah Mendelbaum, Avram Zederbaum, they play all of the brides, all of the grooms, the writers, the socialists, so ardent in their beliefs, so passionate in their lovemaking. On the violin, Nellie Friedman. On the clarinet, Meyer Balsam. And on the accordion, Mr. Moritz Godowski. My name is Lemel. You can also call me Lou. I am the stage manager tonight. Usually, you can find me backstage. We have a story we want to tell you about a play, a play that changed my life. Every night, we tell this story, but somehow, I can never remember the end. No matter. I can remember how it begins. It all starts with this moment. Remember this. Wir singen alle Brüder, oi, oi, alle Brüder, und wir singen freche Lieder, oi, oi, oi. Und wir halten sich in einem, oi, oi, sich in einem, und sag, es ist nicht so bei keinem, oi, oi, oi. Oi, 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 oi. Oh, 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 as in it's awful. Oh, as in how do I tell him, as in whom did I marry? Oh, are you crying? I can't breathe. No, oh, as in, it's wonderful. No, oh, it's so sad. I love it. Really? Really. What did you love? Oh, my God, Sholem, it's all in there. The, the roots of all evil, the, the money, the subjugation of women, the false piety, the terrifying violence of that father. And then, oh, Sholem, the, the two girls in the rain scene, my God, the poetry in it. What is it about your writing that makes me hold my breath? You make me feel the desire between these two women is the purest, most chaste, most spiritual. It is! Maja, are you angry that I stole your words for the virgin daughter? If Papa had come downstairs and discovered his little Maria in flagrante... I would never have made it to the Hoopa alive. <laughs> it is interesting to hear your words the night you seduced me in the mouth of a prostitute. I feel like a prostitute every time I have to pander to Mr. Peretz to get a reading in his salon. This play will cause a sensation tomorrow night. All the writers will be green with envy. Mm, don't bring down the evil eye. Mr. Peretz could hate it. Oh, Mr. Peretz is a lovely man, but he's so 19th century. <laughs> Warsaw is a provincial little town. This play will be done all over the world. Moscow, Berlin, <laughs> Paris. Wait, wait, I know who would be perfect for the father. Rudolf Schildkraut. Who? Rudolf Schildkraut is a sensation in Berlin right now with this merchant of Venice. I'll ask Papa for money to send you. We must get this play to him. It's my first play. Our play will catch fire in Berlin. All the German intelligentsia can talk about right now is Dr. Freud. It's the 20th century. We're all attracted to both sexes. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I'll understand if you get attracted to a man. But I will kill you oh. if it's another woman. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you I'll understand if you get attracted to a woman as long as I can watch. <laughs> 
My God, I am now married to a playwright. <laughs> You're my warrior, my suffragette. You're lesbian? Teach me. Take me. I, I want, want to, to taste, taste you. We wanted to thank um, fellow Scott Wheeler for conjuring the McDowells with Edward's most famous composition, To a Wild Rose. Thank you, Scott, so much. And everybody, please keep eating. Thank you so much, um, and good evening to everybody uh, for being here. It's wonderful to see so many artists and patrons who form the community of McDowell here tonight. We hope that you're all having a wonderful evening. Anne and I want to speak with you for a moment about what it means for McDowell to be a contemporary center for art and ideas for 110 years. Before we do that, let me ask Anne, who at McDowell now is famous? And the answer, of course, is we don't know yet. It's true. Embracing the very kind of creative risk-taking that is inherent to the artistic process McDowell has awarded fellowships to myriad unknown artists who have gone on to produce great works. Artists such as Alice Walker, Leonard Bernstein, Colson Whitehead, Louise Erdrich, and Zoe Leonard, to name just a few who were unknown when they first came to the colony. In fact, much of the work made at McDowell is ahead of the marketplace. We can easily overlook the impact our town would have had in 1938 when Thornton Wilder removed the fourth wall between the audience and the actors and created a play of universal simplicity and truth. This was strange stuff for the American stage, and when it opened in Boston, many theater goers walked out on it. Of course, later that year, it earned Wilder a Pulitzer Prize and an enduring place in our cultural inheritance. Today, anecdotes like that are captured in McDowell's colorful history. But try for a moment to think about them happening real time in our own present day. Today's Oscar and Tony and National Book Award winning classics were yesterday's bold and untested ideas. And that is what we want you to keep in mind about McDowell. McDowell is and has been a contemporary center for art and ideas for 110 years. The magic of McDowell is founded on the belief in the creative process and the faith of its patrons, people like you who for generations have come out year upon year to support the creation of art. And that brings us to our ask for this evening. This is a lovely way to spend an evening viewing work made at McDowell gathering the community together, but of course this is a fundraiser, and we wouldn't be serving McDowell if we didn't also remind everyone, as you have been reminded several times tonight, that we're here for the artists whose names we may not yet know, who rely on our continued belief in their talent and in the creative process. And we can best demonstrate that con conviction of our own through our financial support. There are a couple of ways to support McDowell this evening. We hope many of you have discovered the silent auction. I hear, in fact, that many of you have, and thank you for that. But for any of you, and there's about another 20 minutes to go on that, uh, for any of you who do not take home an auction prize, we have an alternative. <laughs> it is now my pleasure to invite our friend and board, board colleague extraordinaire David Baum, up to the stage to help us light a fire for arts support. Good evening. I can know you do better than that. Good evening. Good evening. Ah, it's 
Nice to see you. It's great up here. Uh, let me get a sense of uh, how some of the folks in the room. Uh, would you please raise your hands if you know me? Ah, oh, see ya. My friends, good. Raise your hands if you don't know me. Uh, raise your hands if this is at your first McDowell benefit evening. Oh, fabulous. Raise your hands if you're an artist. 64 of them, fabulous. Uh, raise your hands if you wouldn't put your hand up in the air no matter what question I ask you. Raise your hands. <laughs> so, what have we established? We've established now that most of you know how to raise your hands. <laughs> so we're going to do something called a Dutch auction. Uh, not my name, apologies to the Dutch. Here's how it works. We're going to raise money from the room. I'm going to ask at certain amounts, and I'm going to ask you to put up your hand, and then on the honor system, if you're so moved, because we all know this is a good cause, and this is really worthwhile, and it helps support artists. And we really want to give just a little bit more. But it raises a question that I know many of you have. And the question is, really, what's my incentive? When a board member comes up and says, would you give it a little bit more, what's my incentive? So I'm going to show you what your incentive is. I'm going to show this to you, just give you a little peek of what's going to come, because we want to have some fun. You want to have some fun? All right, so here we go. So, when I start asking, if I get an enthusiastic response from this room, I will take this flaming torch, I will relight it, I will put it in my mouth a couple of times, and then I will put it out. I will fire eat. That's right. I will frickin' eat fire for you. <laughs> That's how badly I want this. Meet Fire Marshal Bill. <laughs> Fire Marshal Bill, what have I personally paid you to stand here tonight and look serious and in command? $600. $600. That's right. I paid him $600 to seriously stand there. <laughs> now, right now, you're probably thinking, wow, they don't do this at the Met. <laughs> we are way past Sondheim now. But I'm only going to do it if you step up for McDowell and the artists who want to light their creative fire every day. Only if you, who know the challenges that every artist in America faces, puts their hand in the air and helps support the cause. Only if you just give a little bit more of your generosity to protect the work of artists under the most difficult of conditions and who deserve everything we can afford and then some. You put your hands in the air, you make this happen, and I will give you something you never expected when you sat down tonight at dinner. So when I start asking, you start raising, because protecting artists happens only if we collectively raise our voices and we do this together. Finally, consider this, every time one of you raises their hands. Somewhere in heaven, an angel gets their wings. <laughs> and Donald Trump loses a little bit of hair. So, if we could have the house lights up, please. Just so I could see. And just up a little bit, great. So, we're going to start off with the big, the mother of all numbers, $10,000. Was anyone to give $10,000 for a residency and to see me eat fire, to support the artist? $10,000 raises an enormous amount for McDowell. Just one hand in the air, that's all I'm asking. Just one hand, one hand. This was Fire Marshal Bill's first musical performance, he told me. One and two back there. 10,000, 20,000, that's great. Thank you so much. All right, let's give those folks a round of applause. 
I love my friends. All right. How about $5,000? Can I see a few hands around the room for $5,000 to contribute to next year's Pulitzer Prize winner? $5,000. Five? We have a hand up? Great. Thank you so much, John. How about $1,000? $1,000 to keep Mrs. McDowell's vegetable garden bountiful. $1,000. Get those hands up. Put them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ah, oh, that's great. Great. Get those hands up. Thank you so much. All right. You know those fabulous, famous picnic baskets? $500. How many $500 do I have in the room? Come on. Come on. You can do it. Remember. The hair, it's coming, it's coming. Get that hand up. Yes, $500. All right. Thank you. And now this question. $100. $100. Honestly, $100. That was like an Uber ride from Long Island. $100. Every gig counts. When Mrs. McDowell toured the country, people would give as little as five cents to help the cause. And today's dollars, that's $100,000. $100, come on, let me show those hands. Come on, you can do this. It's for McDowell. Let's give those folks a big round of applause. All right. So I thought that was pretty enthusiastic. If you raise your hands, please, you're on the honor system. <laughs> Write your name down on your card, and we thank you. And now it's time for me as a board member of McDowell, who, by the way, has been doing this for 40 years. It will be safe. I learned this from Penn Jillette to meet my responsibilities. Are you ready? Thank you to all who gave.